last lecture, and that's uh, Made You Look, a collective from Johannesburg that consists of uh, Molemo Moila, Moiloa and Nara Mogoto. Um, you are both here since last April, thanks also to the DAAD. Um, I'm very thrilled that you are with us here at the Berlin University of the Arts. Um, a few words. Um, you are uh, working very interdisciplinary as an artistic duo. Um, and um, your, let's say, um, title made you look is basically referencing what you do or your methodology. You make people look in certain corners, in certain directions, uh, look at things that are maybe overseen. And um, from what I understand, you're kind of mm, exploring the epistemological surplus, like the knowledge part of also very everyday um, popular imaginaries in your work. And um, you take as a point of departure also everyday black experiences or practices that have either been historically overlooked or neglected or deemed inconsequential. Um, you both met while studying fine arts in Johannesburg and now you're an artistic duo. I think we will learn a lot from you about collaboration, research and investigation and um, transdisciplinary work. So thank you for being here and the stage is yours. And a warm applause <laughs> to Nara Molemo. This is my collaborator, Nare. Hello. And we are Meiji Look. And um, today we want to kind of try something a little different. Um, we don't always find it very easy to talk about our projects specifically. So we're going to be talking to you about how we work and um, what kind of leads the decisions we make about our work. Um, you can read up about all of our projects on our website, so it's all there. Um, but we're going to be sort of talking about what happens in the background as we, as we work together. 
and um, partially to entertain ourselves. Uh, it's going to be mostly sound based um, today, so we're going to be playing a few sound clips for you, some crappy quality, some better. And um, what we're hoping is to have a little bit of a vibe from you as well, so we're going to play some of the sounds and ask you kind of what you're hearing. And we'd really appreciate it if you would find some generosity to kind of share what you're hearing, feeling, what's kind of coming up for you. Um, and that's yeah, yeah, that's it. So um, just a quick introduction beyond the, the bio that Lucas already gave. Uh, yes, we started working together in our fourth year? Fourth year, yeah. Fourth year of university. So the undergraduate fine art degree is four years in South Africa. Uh, and we were classmates and in, in a large part we started working together because we kind of were frustrated with our education. Um, it's not that long ago, but um, was quite sort of modernist. Um, installation was like edgy. <laughs> and um, we were, the way universities, and particularly in the city we're from, Johannesburg, are is they're actually like fenced. And you can't get in if you're not a student. You need a card. Well, you needed a card when we were there. Now you need biometrics, your fingerprint, to get in. And if you don't pay your fees, because you have to pay fees in South Africa, uh, they like lock your finger so you can't get into your classes. And um, our university is actually right in the city centre, which is where Nari and I grew up. Um, but we almost never left. Like the, well, I mean, we did because like Nari walked to school and mm -hmm. I sometimes took the bus. And um, most people never like left that gate to go into the city centre, um, which is kind of a little bit sort of more run down. It's mostly black, etc. So the university felt very elitist and our artistic studies felt very disconnected to the places we came from. And so in large part, we started working together to try and reimagine what our practice could be. Um, it's changed a lot over the 13, 14 years we've worked together. Um, when we started off, we did a lot more sort of public space work. Um, we were kind of not really in gallery spaces all that much. And it was mostly just the two of us. And that's changed a lot over time, partly um, out of maybe like just maturing, getting a bit older, uh, definitely from making some mistakes. Um, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how that shifted. Mm. And well. share some of those mistakes as well. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So we're going to start with, um, I think, one of four approaches to our art making. Um, and the first of these is something that we call community of practice. Um, and with each of um, the approaches, we will provide a very loose definition and then kind of go into what exactly we mean with that um, definition, kind of unpacking um, all the different aspects of it. Um, so the first one, as I said, is community of practice. And by this, we mean a group of practitioners who share similar intellectual interests um, or that are wrestling with questions that intersect with our own and with whom there is a mutual exchange benefit and solidarity. Um, so as Mulumu mentioned uh, before, um, we go into each of the sections, I will play a sound clip and then I will ask for a bit of, as Mulumu said, vibe uh, from you. Um, so I will ask you just in very simple terms just to let me know what you heard. Um, I'm not expecting anything super kind of dense and conceptual, just something very basic description of what it is, the sound clip. Um, did. Um, so here we go. When they make a gem out of this, you will love it. Woo! Too sour. Woo! Ah, you put the whole thing in your mouth. Too sour, man. Oh, man. Okay. What is it? The talker. The talker. The talker. Uh, the botanical name, they call it Kephalantas natalensis. And in English, they call it strawberry bush. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And then you, <laughs> you, you make a jam out of this. Then they start green. Then they, when they, make, they start flowering, like the flower is like, what can I say? It's like uh, having something sharp. Okay. Yeah, around it. And then uh, they start green. Then they become red in color, like the one you see. And then they become white, they ripe. Okay, in history, in history, just think of Africa. There were no bottle stores, there were no beers. Yeah. What did happen? What did they drink? They 
did make a beer out of this. It's too they sour. They fermented. Yeah, it's too sour. Mm. They make a beer out of this. And the milk plum, the one I, I, I talk about. His face doesn't even twitch. Mm. <laughs> 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 you like them, no? Eh? Yeah, no, they, I grew up here. Let me try another one. I grew up here. They're healthy. That's why your grand grandmother lived like 110 <laughs> years. And me and you, we can make it. Cool. Any takers? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I had to think about the visit somewhere. So a person who's really familiar with something somewhere and somebody who comes there and mm -hmm. tries to understand and um, yeah, to get in contact with the person. Yeah, cool. Anyone else? Somebody trying a berry or something, trying out new food. Yeah. And one more? Yeah. He was going to uh, start singing a song. He <laughs> 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 yeah. Unfortunately, he didn't. Um, but the clip that you're listening to is actually from a five hour hike um, that we did with this man. Um, and he is someone we've been working with for the past five years on some research. Um, some research that influenced some work that we've done over these past five years, but also culminated um, in a work that um, was first exhibited at Documenta. Um, we continue to work with this man um, for his expertise and his knowledge. And he is actually someone that other researchers um, in various fields on the history of a people in South Africa um, seek out for his experiences. Um, so these include botanists, um, there's archaeologists in the group and there's historians um, who go, all go to this man for what he has to offer. Um, so what we're doing here is we, on this hike, are stopping intermittently and he is stopping to show us, as you're saying, some berries, um, other times other plants for like medicinal use, um, but always he is telling us about what all of these plants are used for. Um, when, for example, over here we're tasting a green berry that hasn't been ripe, um, he's also telling us about what it looks like when it ripens. So it goes from red into like white, um, but it always kind of remains tart. And then he's describing like the leaves of certain plants as well, when you can't immediately kind of say, it's that one over there. Other times when walking is like, yeah, but this is unusual for this plant to be up here. It should be further up um, this mountain. Um, so he is someone who knows these plants um, having grown up on this piece of land. Um, so he works for um, a family who own this massive plot of land. Um, he's grown up in that area and over the past 20 years working for them, he's gone up this mountain multiple times. So there's on the one hand this kind of lived experience and this very somatic bodily knowledge that's come over naturally many years. But then there's also this kind of sought out theoretical knowledge. So he is a qualified uh, bird guide, but he's also a qualified field guide. Um, again, people seek him out for his knowledge. So there's always this kind of like combination between the lived and the theoretical. Um, and these are the kinds of people that we always seek out um, in our practice. Um, so early on, um, over here, as you can see, we've got some chosen community. Um, we have always had collaboration um, at the center of our practice, uh, but early on we were quite undeliberate about who those people were. Very often they were friends, some of them now still friends, um, but collaboration seemed to happen very much on the basis of like we like you and therefore let's collaborate. Um, other times it was lecturers we liked, hey collaborate with us on the work. Um, but over the years, we have become a lot more um, intentional, um, and this word intentional will come up multiple times as we're speaking about our work. We've become, we've become a lot more intentional about um, the kinds of relationships that we forge with people, um, and the kinds of people, and the kinds of knowledges um, they possess. Um, some of the people in this community of practice um, are artists, activists, um, farmers, growers, um, theorists, uh, social scientists, um, so it's a whole range of people, but what unites all of these people is that they have um, a shared agenda of practice with us, 
Um, and again, when I say this shared agenda of practice, a lot of that is influenced um, by these different forms of knowledges. And we definitely rely upon people who have uh, an established practice. Um, so these are people who've been working for multiple, multiple years. And the reason we go for people with an established practice is because we work in this way of moving from one knowledge field into another. And so we rely very heavily on them to kind of ground our own thinking, but also that the thinking has depth, because I think so often when we work as artists who say we're working in interdisciplinary ways and uh, transdisciplinary ways, um, we can do quite a disservice um, to the fields in which we're entering. Um, so having this community of practice around us just ensures that we are drawing upon their knowledges and we're starting our thinking from where the field requires our thinking to happen. Um, so over here we have um, two people from our community of practice. As I said, um, a lot of this is quite extensive. Um, but over here we've got, um, he appears twice, this is uh, Temba Mdambo, um, who is an urban beekeeper who studied farming. Um, so he studied industrial farming for many, many years, then tried to go into it um, and found that the ethics of a lot of kind of monocropping um, just didn't sit well with him. Um, and so he started beekeeping as a kind of small scale way to get into farming and still be um, connected to the land and um, plant life and the natural world. Um, then we have, in the same image, um, a gentleman by the name of Mr. Mogwena, um, who is a mad scientist, um, who just does a whole bunch of like, things with plants that are just like out of this world. Um, so you can see from this very kind of basic example that our community of practice also tends to be um, intergenerational. So it's not just people who are our contemporaries, but we also kind of do this thing of inheriting knowledges that um, have very often been sidelined um, and kind of been on the fringes. And so we try to draw upon um, those expertise as well. The other thing with um, our community of practice is that it, it is always long term. Um, so we come back to the same people again and again. Um, so that there is always um, a continuation of the relationship. Um, so over here we have um, a woman scholar by the name of Denai Mopoza, who is a poet, writer, um, but also um, a lecturer in the African uh, Literature Department um, in Johannesburg. So again, there's multiple things that like our uh, community of practice um, also do. Uh, so much like us, um, there is a disciplinary rooting, but then there's also this tendency to be like undisciplined. And so what the whole community of practice does is try to contain that undisciplinedness. So we rely upon um, each other's uh, practices and expertise. Um, and then in the middle you have uh, someone called Mpati Mota, um, who is a permaculturalist, uh, but is also a DJ. Um, a very good one. Um, and he, <laughs> He plays music for uh, plants, so he calls his sets plant music. Um, so the audience, primary audience, is always the natural world, and we as humans are always um, secondary to that. And then finally, the man on the far right um, is the person you were hearing in that sound clip. Uh, this is Joseph Mutupi, who is this incredible land worker. Then another element of our community practice is mutuality. Um, so people give to our practice and we like to give back to theirs. Um, we reflect quite often um, on the work of our community of practice. Um, so one of the things we do as Major Look is that we write quite a bit. Um, so there's journal chapters, there's book chapters, there's self-published zines, but then we also do things like podcasts, kind of reflecting upon all of these um, different elements that influence us. Um, one of the things that we're always deliberate about um, is to also reference this community of practice wherever we go. Um, so it's not just about kind of a sharing, I suppose, but it's also um, about an incorporation of people's pers uh, perspectives um, and often their own working methodologies. So in the picture, we are sitting with someone called Dineos Kosana, um, who is a political scientist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Um, and she has developed some theories and perspectives um, around an issue called uh, spiritual security that we share very often. Wherever we go on a public talk or when we write about things that connect to this, we always quote her. And whenever our community of practice has things that they think uh, would be invigorated or um, be furthered by our participation, we always um, go for um, that as well. And then finally, um, cross-contextual solidarities. Um, over the years, we have been very deliberate as well to move outside of our own context in South Africa um, and to look at particularly the majority world um, for these kind of cross-contextual solidarities where there are historical and contextual specificities that we think that we can learn from. Um, and over here, you have a set of images from um, a series of exhibitions that we curated over a year, I think, back in 2019, 2020, um, which were all on land um, territory. And we invited uh, four artists from around the world um, to kind of share their work in the South African context in order that our conversations about land in South Africa might be energized uh, by their own learnings in their own contexts. Um, so we had a farming collective from China and Hong Kong um, called uh, Samud Gun. Um, in the top left um, corner is um, a series of films that we showed from Oaxaca in Mexico, um, which are very short, 10 minute long uh, pieces um, that we kind of activated through um, screenings and a discursive program. And then downstairs we have um, a show from Namibia, um, which is one of our neighbors, but we know very little of and they land politics. So that's community of practice. Cool. Uh, so another thing that's kind of central to the way that we work, and I want to have my notes. I don't want to forget anything, um, is uh, what I'm calling records of presence. I didn't ask you if you agree with this term, <laughs> um, but um, it's effectively like a complicated phrase for archive, really. Um, but it's um, been really important to the way that we work, um, documents, sound recordings, and other forms of collective memory that give historical presence to contemporary practices. So most of our work is really looking at contemporary, everyday black life, things that just happen every day on the street corner that you don't even notice. But we really um, spend a lot of time looking through records to try and understand that thing within historical context. Um, so we're going to play another sound clip. give a sort of sense of even if not being able to understand the language what are you feeling what's coming up for you it's like a, 
Go ahead and then listen. It sounds like dance, uh, something uh, even a bit ritualistic because everybody's doing the same thing, I feel, by the sound. Yeah. Ritualistic sort of sound at the back there? Yeah, I think about that too. And also, like, when in the beginning, it was like you were at a church or something. Mm -hmm. And then when the animal sounds came, I kind of felt like I was in the zoo. <laughs> you know, in those like chambers where like they make where they like make the bird sounds come out of nowhere. So it was kind of like like a more dark candlelit uh, feeling. Nice. Like was there someone here? Yes. Yeah, I don't know if it was intended, but the second sound bit um, it reminded me a little bit also of a working sound somehow mm -hmm. with this beating. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, did you notice that the two songs are actually the same? No, okay. <laughs> so, the first one is um, an archival uh, recording of a song from 18... You see this one in my notes? 1897, I don't want to lie to you. Yes, 1897, um, by a South African um, composer. It's a sort of Methodist choral song. Um, Recorded in the 1930s, though, this recording is from the 1930s, um, of a song called In Gozisikeleli, which is actually now the South African national anthem. It's also the anthem of Zambia, Zimbabwe, and I think maybe Tanzania. They're all in their own languages. Um, and um, it's, it, the reason it's also the anthem of those countries is because it sort of spread across southern and east Africa as an um, anti colonial song. Um, and it's actually the same song later, um, but in a form that has kind of emerged since 2015, um, which we call the decolonial anthem. Uh, in 2015, we had these mass student protests uh, that sort of swept the country and changed the country forever, kind of, um, that were looking at, on the one hand, trying to get free education, um, and on the other, um, to think about decolonizing the university. Um, and what the, the decolonial anthem does is um, uh, tries to use something called a struggle or try the format of a struggle song. And um, struggle songs in South Africa uh, come from a, pro a protest tradition in South Africa. So this is archival footage from the 70s and 80s uh, in our fight against um, apartheid to try and uh, the country was separated between white and then every, everybody else was also separated. And this, this was, these were the protests to try and fight for everybody to um, have the right to vote and to have general basic rights as well. And um, that sound that you're hearing, the work sound, the, the like, very heavy beat is called toy toy, which is what they're doing here. Um, and so it, it represents a kind of militaristic sort of thing. But the, the main thing is that um, in South Africa, we, would, we sing when we protest. It's still something that we do. We sing and we move and we dance um, when we're protesting. And it always works in this call and response style. So the second version is in this call and response style, taking that choral, sort of very Western church mode, and doing this call and response. So someone will lead, and then everybody else who's, who's running with will, will do the kind of response part. And um, using these kinds of archives, so the second part is actually from a work of ours, the one that we showed, a documenta, um, and uses this sort of um, archive not only of um, this kind of choral music and this really old song, but also then this popular tradition of music um, as a kind of um, mode of connecting <coughs> contemporary practice through time. Um, and we do this in, in various ways in all of our projects. Research becomes really vital to enabling a kind of um, depth to the things that we're looking at at the moment. Um, on the one hand, that is a kind of reaction against the fact that often contemporary black culture is seen as stuck in time. It's kind of like only contemporary. And the build of its like historical background isn't there. 
um, and isn't really recognized. And I found a good Hegel quote, <laughs> which I'm going to read to you. I want to I get the exact words. Um, that gives you a bit of a perspective of this, which is a long um, kind of historical problem of how contemporary black culture is often looked at. So, according to Hegel, in 1956, at this point we leave Africa, not to mention it again, for it is no historical part of the world. It has no movement or development to exhibit. What we properly understand by Africa is the unhistorical, undeveloped spirit still involved in the conditions of mere nature and which had to be presented here only as on the threshold of the world's history. And these kinds of notions are not just Hegel, no, they're, they're, they're much broader. Um, and so creating this kind of connection through time is really vital for a lot of the work that we do. And we do, we work with archive in various ways. This is another example where we did a project about love um, and um, forms of kind of working class expressions of, uh, of black people in love. And um, again, can be seen as a kind of contemporary modern thing. Um, and so we looked for love in the archive um, and we went to, for example, love letters from the 1950s uh, between migrant workers um, who were being separated because of the political situation in South Africa where a, woman wasn't allowed to, a black woman wasn't allowed to be in the city um, in that period. And so uh, men had to go work and the women had to stay in the village and these love letters are kind of from this context. Um, and we had a number of other um, uh, archival texts as well in this exhibition that tried to create this kind of linkage between what is seen as a, the practice we were looking at is like the youth of today and the silly things they do. <laughs> Um, but we were trying to like, connect it to this long history of why it emerges in this way. Um, and so having these, these archives present and people could take them is very much part of, part of that. Uh, that said, uh, proving people like Hegel wrong is not really our primary interest. <laughs> um, and so actually this connection to history is more important to us in order to create a kind of fullness of our own ideas and fullness of the the parts of our cultures that we don't necessarily look at. So it's actually more of a practice for ourselves um, than for Hegel. Um, and, and so um, when we're working with these archives, sometimes we're also trying to um, kind of prove a point to our own cultural practices that haven't really been developed enough. So here's another project. Um, you've probably seen there's like a lot of gardening going on. So we have, <laughs> we have a few works on land and plant life and relationships to plant life. And, and this one um, also worked with archives. Um, and uh, what you're seeing here actually, so this image is from a collection of photographs from the 50s um, in a place called Old Benoni location. And in the 50s, uh, there were a few parts of South Africa where black people, white people, so-called colored people, and so-called Indian people, these are all categories in South Africa, all lived in the same place. And um, the state didn't want that. And so it separated these people. So this garden would have been completely flattened. And these people, because they were black, would have been moved to another place. Um, and they would have been forced away from their neighbors, away from their homes, um, and put somewhere else. Uh, what you see on the other side is actually um, some of the houses that were then built um, and people who were forcibly removed were put um, in these areas and these people then built houses and then they rebuilt gardens. Um, and so having this archive for us is important to show that kind of resilience because when you plant a garden, you, you plant it for the long term, right? You, you don't sort of plant your peach tree and then uh, leave in two years time. No, you, 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 you're saying I'm gonna be here, I'm gonna be present, I'm gonna make my home, I'm gonna place, make a place that I feel safe. And so, in this way, even though we're doing projects about contemporary black gardening and urban farming, etc., we look at this archive also to look at the way that black people have used the practice of gardening as a way of um, making space for themselves, right? So it becomes um, a kind of practice that's important for ourselves as well. Last one. Thanks. <laughs> Me again. Um, so the the third approach we want to speak about is what we've called discursive approaches. Um, over here I have two clips back to back, um, but quickly before we get into that, um, the definition we've provided is that these approaches um, are approaches to practice that center gathering 
with others to share knowledges or unpack complex ideas from a shared prompt such as texts, films, exhibitions, and so on. And the aim is for the set of concepts we are engaging with to be vectors that have resonance beyond a fixed moment um, or a particular artifact. So this is the first um, clip. <clears throat> and you mentioned your grandmother, um, but how, how did you end up, I mean, yeah. many of us, we had elders trying to make us garden yeah. and we were not interested. Um, of course. How, how did that same, happen? With, same with me. I, of course, growing up, I was all just seeing grandmother inside the garden, I would see vegetables. Nature was always there. I've always been in love with nature. But, you know, with the background of not knowing what direction you can take. You know, when you're growing up, you, you find you don't find institutions that can help you, you know, you know find yourself properly. You know. So within me, I knew that nature was part of me really in all angles. You know, but it was just growing up to understand it more. So as I grew up, it became attached to me really every time. <laughs> and so it became automatically. I I I, I just stepped in found myself okay. this is where I belong and the second clip <laughs> adding to that she's not yes. the only one uh, <laughs> I think there was a time in so where to where I don't know how it got to spread you know this system of people paving their homes because that's also what I've just seen around so where to it was a certain time when it came up uh, part of it I think people thought that it was how you know when you talk about development yes. and you're thinking mm. you know mm. you want to move in a modernized way mm. and you start thinking of certain things instead of maybe they were not knowledgeable but already gardens were already existing in Soviet because yeah. history shows that distribution will happen most houses had fruit trees yeah. most houses had their own little veggies but the people were pregnant at that time I guess it was the elders like your yeah, mother, my grandmother, my my grandmother. Mom. they were practicing it full on. They they did get their food from that veggie patch before it became, you know, now the, with the generation after it came with the supermarkets, your whole world, now people started to again, you know, want to live a modernized way. So of course I need to be seen with carrying this package of <laughs> a supermarket of some sort. So I think it, that's when the problem started you know, because most people they did away with their whole gardens, removing trees, so it, was, it became bad. Those nice buckets you yes. get, you know, where you wash, make holes yeah. in them, put the soil yeah. in the yes. grow. Cool, so there's a lot going on and very little at the same time. Uh, <laughs> are there any takers? This one's difficult. Yeah. I guess uh, you guys were discussing about um, the disconnection of people with planting, gardening, mm -hmm. and you were kind of making conspirative theories to possible reasons why that happened. Yeah. And he talks about the supermarket as a possible reason. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> um, maybe like the generational change, the way that people may perceive gardens now and compared to maybe how it used to be in the past. Mm. Yeah. Maybe also kind of a change in self-sufficiency to kind of consumerism and relying on kind of getting your goods and food from somewhere else. Yeah. Wow. Well, that is such good new things. <laughs> <laughs> what I get from that <laughs> is that the sound quality is really bad. <laughs> and that the person speaking, who is Mpati, um, who was one of the people whose images I showed you, um, he is a very soft-spoken farmer. So very often you have to kind of strain to hear what he's saying. Um, you can hear the birds more than you can hear him, actually. Um, so we're actually outside in the Johannesburg Art Gallery. They've got like a, a courtyard outside so it's, it's fascinating that you can hear the birds more clearly than him. It's not, it's not great, you know, that he's overtaken by the birds, but it worked for the kind of discursive approach that we have been taking for quite a while now. Um, and again, the word intention must be brought back into the conversation. Um, the conversation was had very much between a group of, I think, 30 people um, at the Johannesburg Art Gallery 
And all of us are really just like huddled around in party trying to hear what he's saying about gardening in Soweto. Um, in the second clip, he is actually in conversation with uh, someone of an older generation who is from the same, it's kind of a city, really, Soweto. Um, and they are tracking the, the kind of evolution of gardens in Soweto, I think from about the 50s into the contemporary moment. And they're speaking specifically about a phenomenon that started happening, I think, maybe in the 80s, 90s, where people started paving over their gardens. Um, obviously, one, because of like beautification, it's kind of seen as aspirationally beautiful to have this paving. Um, but the second reason is that it's a lot cheaper to kind of maintain than to, or like at least more, like less effort to maintain than a garden would be. Um, and so what you kind of sense um, that he's doing is that he's always moving between the contemporary moment um, and a historical um, kind of lineage. Um, in the first clip, he credits his grandmother as so someone who's taught him um, to go into permaculture. So even though it wasn't something that he was taught is permaculture, he's always been doing it. Um, and then in the second clip, again, he's kind of speaking about this contemporary moment, but then always placing it on a historical trajectory. So early on, we started um, working with uh, discursivity. We've always been very interested in that, um, but very often when discursivity is mentioned um, in uh, the contemporary art world, it can be uh, to speak about the exhibition catalogue, um, or maybe like a, a walkabout. Um, and early on, we knew that there was more. Um, as Millimore was saying um, earlier, much of our education uh, felt to be quite modernist. Um, and so when we discovered things like relational aesthetics, it really just blew our minds and really shifted things for us. And so we went immediately into discursivity because it was something that felt very much legitimized by finding people around the world who were doing similar work. Um, early on, we decided to have these um, lectures where we invited university lecturers to give um, university level talks um, on the metro in South Africa, in Johannesburg. And the train space in South Africa is a very particular one. It's not like getting on the U-Bahn, for example, where people of multiple classes use the U-Bahn. In South Africa, this is very much the working class mode of transport, particularly in, South Afri uh, in Johannesburg. In other places like Cape Town, it's a bit more complicated. Um, and the train historically has been a very violent and turbulent space, uh, particularly um, throughout the sort of mid 80s um, and to mid 90s, the tr transition years of South Africa from apartheid into a democratic um, country. Um, and so, we invited these people to come on and give these free public uh, lectures. Um, we have since moved away from these kind of public interventions because, for one, it feels to be quite an imposition into people's like space, um, and also assumes that people want and need art. Um, <laughs> um, one of the mistakes, yes. Um, and then we started to. Um, evolve this idea of the lecture um, because in our work we have often worked within the academy and outside of the academy. As I mentioned earlier on, um, we write quite extensively, um, but our work also tends to be very research focused and we move again between different uh, fields of knowledge. So academia um, is something that is kind of central um, in some ways to our work. Um, but we always thought that um, the lecture could be one way. So the second picture on the right is from a 2014 exhibition um, where we also had a lecture series that happened over three weeks where we invited um, academics and thinkers in South Africa who were also thinking about love, which was the topic we were uh, working through in 2014. And what we came to discover is that the ways in people speak about a subject actually matters. Um, what we ended up having, instead of people speaking in very tender, intimate ways about love, 
it became very academicized, it was very cold, and it wasn't the kind of space that we were trying to create, nor the atmosphere we were trying to create. Um, and so this became a big turning point um, for our work. Um, from here, we completely abandoned um, the lecture format as we know it, where you have audience and expert kind of speaking um, into something that is much smaller, where we, again, are very intentional about who we invite um, into these gatherings. Um, so generally, we'll have about 15 or 20 people who come there, and from that 15, we'll maybe reach out to like about seven who we know are definitely interested in the subject matter, um, who are people who might be from an extended community of practice, but not necessarily people um, that we are working with. Um, so over here, um, this is a Berlin-based artist um, called Maro Senos, who we met through Documenta, um, and immediately our practices kind of resonated with one another. Um, and she is in conversation outside a community garden, which Mulemo is part of um, in Johannesburg, um, locked out because it's illegal. <laughs> um, and she is in conversation um, with someone who is doing a lot of work on um, land uh, labor rights um, in South Africa. Um, and there's maybe, again, about 15 of us in attendance um, uh, speaking to them and listening um, to um, what they have to say. Then on the far left, you can see we are having like a picnic style reading group. Um, again, the spaces are intimate, um, the ways of speaking are very everyday. We never really become too academicized, too like highfalutin, and we do that without trying to dumb down the content. Um, and then downstairs, um, we have someone called Wandering Sun from our community of practice um, who is doing a workshop with young people, um, a growing workshop. Um, and again, over there, just a very small group of uh, people who, um, what we try to do with these small gatherings is to have something that is a lot more generative, a lot more juicy. Um, uh, and I mean juicy in, uh, in a way where um, everyone who's coming there has a kind of interest in the subject matter. The conversations tend to be a lot more constructive and generative. Um, and don't seem to be one way. Um, we can go into so many different things and like unpacking little nuggets, little small sentences, as opposed to like the typical, hey, I have a three-part question. Um, the first is about the Hegelian formation, which is just like the worst way of like engaging for us. Um, no shade uh, to anyone who loves that, but just not our chosen way. The other reason why we uh, work in this discursive way and what discursivity enables us um, is to um, unpack layers. Um, so as you might have guessed by now, a lot of our work is very long-term research-based. Um, so we've got projects from 2012, which are still ongoing and are still being researched and just have multiple iterations. Um, so unpacking layers, for example, would mean, um, in this instance, we are in Johannesburg and we're playing um, our local context, uh, the work that we showed in Germany. So it was always um, an intention of ours to show in Germany, but then in some small way have this work go back to its own context um, where it emerges. And so here we have this listening session of about 20 minutes, and then we begin to go into the five years of research, the multiple layers that are going on in the work. Um, we also work with an idea we refer to as opacity, where different audiences can access our work at different levels. Um, so there's one level that might be kind of more sort of generic, kind of descriptive, and then someone might be able to access uh, something more conceptual, but then someone who is very familiar with the context, for instance, and um, has lived those experiences has so much more access to the little subtleties and nuances um, that are going on in the work. Um, so discursivity becomes a way for us to go through all those um, layers. Um, another way in which we unpack these layers is through this writing practice of ours. Um, very often after the first, maybe even the second iteration of a work, 
what we'll do is we'll sit down and we'll write about the work. So there's a lot of writing on our website about projects where in retrospect we'll sit and kind of analyze work and the work will be speaking back to us and saying things that we didn't even intend to put into it. So the work itself kind of gains the subjectivity and gives so much more than we initially thought. At other times, it might be something that we kind of hint at in a work that is an interest of ours that we might want to move off into a different form. And so that's kind of what unpacking these different layers means for us. And then finally, discursivity allows us to connect to context um, in ways that are meaningful. And by this, we mean that we um, work across multiple contexts. Um, and our work, though, is very um, based in a black lived experience, which um, emerges out of South Africa, but obviously has many touch points with other spaces in the world. Um, and the way in which we show is we try to tailor um, each of our works for when we show it elsewhere. And one of the ways to do that is to bring in a community of, of um, practice that we try to forge ahead of exhibitions or ahead of going into like a space to do our research. Um, so, for instance, um, the top left image over there, um, the guy on the other side who's got the dreads, Mr. Alone, and the audience, uh, that's Charles Nembard, and he is an allotment farmer in Nottingham. Um, and we already started forging a relationship with him, I think, two years before we showed in Nottingham, um, so that when we do finally go there, um, we are speaking very much to the context with people who are familiar and have been doing the work much longer than we have so that we're not kind of parachuting in um, and just kind of talking to a context without any knowledge. Um, here is a similar kind of thing um, which happened in Kassel over the summer and we are doing what we refer to as garden talks um, and in garden talks as the name suggests we just sit in a garden and we talk but we invite someone who, um, whose practice we really look up to um, and kind of admire um, and who has kind of similar questions that they're exploring in their work. Um, in this case, it is um, Fernando uh, Garcia Dori from Inland, collective from Spain. Um, other forms of discursivity um, are workshops. Um, that bottom image over there is, um, I think, a week-long seminar that we were part of that um, kind of helped um, early career artists kind of think through uh, their work. Yeah. So as you can tell, sorry, I'm speaking too quickly. As you can tell from these photographs, um, this is not usually how we would do a talk. And uh, we invite you to come to Joburg and we can do this again and it'll probably be under a tree because um, that's kind of the environment that we have our conversations. Um, so just to close off, um, we do actually make things, uh, sometimes we even draw, <laughs> um, and um, that, I mean, our, our work is quite sort of physical and uh, thingy-ish, but um, we thought that it would be a slightly different way to approach it by not actually sharing that with you, and thank you for being so generous <laughs> to try and make sense of what we've been presenting to you, which is, is it's, it's not to say that we're not showing you the work, because clearly this is the work for us. Um, and I think we, d we wanted to give you a sense of, on the one hand, how we work, how we collaborate, how we spend our time, but also why we work. Um, and so the, the thing with um, the work that we make is that um, we kind of, we have something to say. Um, we, we do actually want to communicate with people and we want to communicate in very particular kinds of ways. And those people are our kind of community of practice, all these people we collaborate with, um, but then also the kind of broader public that we engage with. And in, in each case, we want to kind of create a very particular intention around that relation. Um, and so creating spaces of relationality is probably the kind of vital way of how we work. Um, and just a last point that Nari has kind of already spoken to this, but. Um, because of this way of working, we don't really think of our work as multidisciplinary or transdisciplinary, um, but we like this term undisciplined, uh, which we heard, first heard from Danai Mopoza, but I think other people came up with it. Um, and we like it in the sense of like 
undisciplined like a naughty child, but also undisciplined in the sense that disciplinary splitting, um, creating these separations between all the people that we work with doesn't make sense. But bringing these things together um, is really the space that we find most exciting and most interesting. So, ta-da, that's it. <laughs> to last week's lecture, no? If you think about all the images and, 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 um, and now this very kind of concise and precise presentation, really appreciated that approach. Um, this is time for you guys to ask a few questions. Maybe I start. Um, also for us again, um, prime example of um, how an artistic, um, an artistic practice is used as a um, yeah, analytic tool in a way, like an investigative tool. Yeah. And you, 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 um, you uh, said even more that it's, um, you use it to kind of explore or investigate or analyze often sidelined histories, mm -hmm. micro histories, uh, in the context of like history with a capital H, it yeah. feels like, no? Um, yes, yeah, so thank you very much. I'm, I'm very inspired also by really understanding how you work and what a long-term commitment this always uh, means for you. Um, maybe I start with the um, first question before I pass the mic to you. You spoke about the community of practice and your collaboration now since 14 years, I understood it right. Um, well, what's your biggest learning in Working collaboratively, co collaboratively. What's 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 your secret to be still, you know, presenting to us 14 years in it, and and working with so many people over such a long period of time in so many different locations? We were talking about Nottingham, Documenta, Joburg. So how do you keep in touch? How do you keep these communities alive? Um, yeah, what's the, what's what's your little secret? I'm going to be very mushy. <laughs> and maybe I think you guys have to move a little bit okay, here sure. so um, that the camera catches. Maybe you sit down? Uh, well, sit I down, then they don't see Just oh, okay. come over oh, here. Oh, for the close, for the close up. Yeah. <laughs> if, like if, you, if you speak around in the middle? Here, over here? Good. Yeah. Okay, um, cool. This is good. Sure. Nice. So, what's the secret to collaboration? And, um, you know, I, th I, th I think it's just going back again and again. Um, and also doing things that aren't necessarily related to the practice, but can't be split from the practice anyway. Um, so a few examples, William and I didn't really have studio, like a studio. Um, we actually both have day jobs back in South Africa. Um, so art making has always been something that we are very deliberate about and we come together um, or, or we used to come together once a week um, in the evenings on Thursday. And the ritual was that one of us would cook, so we'd go to either of our homes, and then in between we're WhatsApping, we're emailing, we're calling, we're doing all these different things that kind of maintain a bit of like a studio, but the thing that works is the ritual of food on a Thursday. When you're cooking, you're kind of speaking, sharing ideas, some of those ideas are not things that will stick now, but then five years down the line, you're like, you remember that thing you said about this? And like, oh yeah, I remember that. And that becomes a trigger for something else. With our community of practice, the same um, applies. Um, we very much believe in the interpersonal. Um, on the 3rd of March, it is my uncle's birthday. Castle uncle. My castle uncle. Um, he is someone who we met months in advance of working in Castle and we just hit it off um, and that's why Malimo calls him my uncle. Um, <laughs> um, and I think it's just important to go back not just for the work but also for the people in order to sustain that um, and then when things kind of just like emerge um, work-wise it doesn't feel to be uh, something that's forced or, or that is extractive. Mm. Yeah. Anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I think that <laughs> I was also thinking about food um, because one of our uh, one of our community of practice actually once invited us 
because uh, he wanted us to work on something that he was working on. And he invited us one day of the week, and we got to his place, and there was no <laughs> food. I think there was just some, like a packet some of crisps, chips. Yeah. <laughs> and we were like, what is this? <laughs> Thursday night. Um, and it, I think that sort of thing of um, also integrating practice into sort of ordinary relationality is how it's maintainable. Mm. It's not really s separate, no? So he's going mm. to back to Kassel for this birthday party because that's his friend and that's what you do with friends kind of thing, um, is, is building it into the kind of rituals of uh, friendship and life and maintaining that as opposed to, um, I think, completely uh, separating it uh, helps mm. to maintain some continuity. Um, I think we're also, we've been able to keep going back to people because we kind of uh, find these threads in our work that enable us to. So, for example, the videos of Oaxaca, we've shown in multiple places. So we, sh we actually showed those videos in Kassel with Nari's uncle um, because he was running a program and we said to him, you know, we've got this DJ who plays uh, plant music, we know this guy who made these films in Oaxaca, uh, is any of this interesting to you? And so then we can connect our community of practice to each other, mm. and, and that sometimes even continues without us. Um, so it, yeah, it kind of builds into a natural flow in a way. Beautiful. Okay, now, first question. Oh, there's many of them. One, two, three. Okay, you start. Um, yeah, I really love it. Yeah, Thank I had you. a question about... You can still okay. the mic. Okay, okay, I had a question. It's not working. It's okay, I don't have to. Thank you. Um, I, you mentioned your connection to the land being from South Africa, and I was wondering if there are any other reasons why you would always do, pr do your practices outside in nature. Is it also a sort of like anti-institutional um, kind of um, like um, desire, or is there... Yeah, I just wanted to know a bit more about why you choose to be outside in nature. That's a nice question. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah it's, it's an interesting question, actually. I mean, I definitely... Um, like, sitting under a tree makes it feel different, mm -hmm. right? Um, and sitting within an institution sets up a certain set of rules. Yeah. Um, and I think we definitely found over time that... Um, <coughs> Uh, being in that na nature environment just helps people chill. And then when there's food, people chill some more. And then you, you really can connect. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily institutional critique, though that is very much where we started. So that first project on the train was really just proving to our lecturers that their knowledge was completely insufficient for the real world. A uh, very student -y <laughs> thing to do. Um, so institutional critique is part of our practice, but I don't know that we're necessarily thinking of institution when we bring people together we're thinking about what that sort of space offers. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we started working on land issues very much from a political perspective. So um, we didn't go into, a, I mean, we touched a bit on South African history, but actually South African history really like is very much on everything we do. Um, and so the land issue is very much related to that and the fact that people have been removed from the land and that hasn't changed. Um, but in working with farmers, like he was saying that um, parties speak really quietly and like farmers never answer their phones and you know they move at a different like time sort of scale you can't rush them those things also s shift the energy so much you know so you start to also learn from them about mm. like yeah how to buy mm. thank you yeah nothing to add by the way a great addition to last talk, the last talk about the countryside, no, but on a completely different level. And, uh, uh, sorry, you had one, but um, before you, there was uh, the you, you know? Hi. Um, I uh, was wondering, do you feel confident when you're um, getting people together? You probably talk about some topics that could be traumatic for someone or hard. How do you get this confidence that in case the situation gets rough, you are able to somehow pick it up before the meeting is over? Or how, what do you study or how do you train the, the power of like shifting the conversation the way that it will be safe? 
I think uh, it's a very good question. Um, when we uh, did this project, for example, in of this sh uh, series of exhibitions we curated, but I mean, we're not really curators, but mm. uh, <coughs> we wanted it, they work in our country. So <laughs> um, there was this project on Namibia, and it was about the German um, genocide in Namibia uh, of Nama and Herero peoples. And um, I remember we were kind of like, how do you have an opening and drink wine mm -hmm. and chit chat when this work is so traumatic? You know? um, and in that one, we, we spoke to that, we went to the artist and we said, it was also at the Goethe Institute. So, like, oh, yeah. um, so we, we went to the artist and we said, look, we don't think it makes sense to do the normal art opening thing. How do we create a space that is respectful to what we're encountering here. And in the end, we decided to have a discussion. Mm. Um, and I think uh, that discussion ended up being very like rows of chairs because so many people came, we couldn't, usually we do like circular, but so many people came that we couldn't entirely fit in. Um, and um, in that case, part of what we found um, is important about creating these, like, like, like I say, we're usually in a circle we're usually under a tree, it's usually not too many people, is that you do create a space that holds much more, and I think therefore is a little bit less triggering. I think we've been lucky that we've mm. never really been in a hyper, that I recall, hyper triggering situation where someone's really reacted. I don't think so. I think you were in one alone, but she ended up being a sweetheart. Was your common life sort of thing, but wasn't us. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I think maybe also because these environments are sl like slightly hold you, um, we've done some stuff about mm. the idea of holding space for certain kinds of ideas, um, that you have to be intentional about kind of the environment in order to hold some of these subjects. Um, but we, we haven't actually been in this, uh, necessarily in a situation that has been extremely triggering to people. But like, for example, sometimes we choose, we choose who we invite. And like, we'll make it public, but then we'll specifically select like, hey, please, will you come? So that, for example, the people in the audience, there's also a good balance of like the types of people, etc. So, so we actually are like a little bit hyper controlling um, to create those kinds of environments. That's been our approach mm. and it's worked so far. Mm. Um, I mean, the only thing I'd add is um, that, I mean, you were speaking earlier about whether our decision to move into the natural world is in some ways like an, um, an alternative to the institution. And now this trauma question kind of comes up as well. Um, and it leads me to think that um, in South Africa, land is very much this kind of like hot button topic, which can be um, very, it can elicit like quite violent reactions uh, from people. It is also something that is very close to every South African, um, especially if you are a black South African where you own less than 13% of land in South Africa. 80% of it still belongs to a, a white minority since about 1913. Um, so these aren't necessarily abstract conversations that we're having and we choose, again, very deliberately to go into what seem like very mundane, everyday um, kind of topics, but actually there's just so much um, kind of affective, emotional, like psychic, just things there to be like unpacked. Um, and I suppose, yes, there is this element of control and like being intentional, um, but we've also just been fortunate. One thing to add actually, now that I think of it, yeah. is our most recent work was very emotional, yeah. um, which was this installation we did at Documenta, um, where, um, which was like a very mourning work about really like the, like um, many people were crying. And like when, when I brought South Africans there, it was very emotional. Also because it was using these struggle songs that are very familiar. Um, but then people from like no contextual relationship who didn't understand the language were also very emotionally moved by the piece. And I think that's partly because sound can be quite powerful in that way. And in that case, um, we generally, with our work, try very hard not to just critique. Um, 
uh, critique is incredibly important work. Saying that A. Hegel is a racist is important work, but we try very hard to move our work also into a space of creation and a space of like, okay, and then what? Um, and I think that, so with the sound piece, um, it starts off very mourning, but like towards the end becomes quite powerful. Um, and we did that on purpose. We wanted it to feel like uh, the work's not done, but like there's some power even somatically in your body as you walk out. And I think that that's partly why that work was incredibly emotional, but not necessarily, at least not from anybody we spoke to, yeah. traumatic. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful question, beautiful answers. Um, before you come, there was one in the back. So you still up? Yes. yes uh, thank you, first of all, for your presentation. Um, so, first thing, I really liked um, how you kind of uh, take um, uh, topics, but for like the, let's say, city persons are far away, or like, City people are ignorant, and even that you come up with the historical part of South Africa or like Africa in general for people that I know, um, like uh, colonized Africa are also ignorant. So you come up with all these topics that are very important for you especially and also other people. Uh, and yes. Um, so my question was though well, how you could uh, collaborate you two especially uh, like for so long time like and how do you feel when you have like um, different topics you want to work on do you also work uh, like separately or I don't know always you make collaborations <laughs> art because I'm not familiar with the work to this. No way. Um, what do we, we do when we don't agree? <laughs> Continue to do your own project as well. Yeah. We make um, art together um, and we do other things outside of making art together. So Major Look is very much the art thing, the, the art activity that we do uh, <laughs> together. Um, when we don't agree, um, I think we try to find a compromise or to try and move the other um, <laughs> into, depending on how big the sort of um, challenge or disagreement is. Um, but I don't know if we've had like anything just like super major that mm. has elicited like anything. Yeah, I've, I've learned to tell when Nari doesn't like an idea. Um, <laughs> firstly, Nari taught me this, he says, I'm just throwing it out there. It's just the first idea. <laughs> so that you can feel like you can play with it. Um, you don't get too attached to the idea. I've learned that when Nari doesn't like an idea, he doesn't say, I think that's bad. He just like ignores it and moves on to something else. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm like, hey, never mind. Sometimes we come back to that idea. Sometimes, yeah, but yeah. better, right? So like, I, I've definitely learned that like, um, we might come back to that thing that I mentioned four or five weeks ago. Yeah. But it'll be in a much better version because um, we've like worked through it. So we, I think we've been able to develop quite a lot of trust of each other's ideas that they make our ideas better. Um, as Nari says, we've never had like a major, mm. we've been, I think also because we do have other lives, um, except this year, <laughs> because we've been on residency together. So we're like full time artists and we're living together. I thought this year was going to be there, <laughs> but actually we've been fine. Um, so we haven't had major disagreements, and I think that's partly because we have out other outlets. It's not like this is everything we do all the time. Um, but as I said, this is like, when we do art, this is it. Um, and yeah, some t I mean, there have been really great ideas, I thought, that we just had to let go of because... But what are the other outlets now? I'm curious for both of you, if not worth it as major. That's a look. long story. Very long story. Um, <laughs> I'll keep it short. <laughs> I, I, I can go into it, but um, I just wanted to say as well that we've also learned um, what a good idea is and how the other person responds. And personally, I'm always looking for the, the wide eyes. And they're very quick. And you, you can see them when something excites the other person. And they immediately kind of just like add. And so that's the, the kind of Teflon. Um, 
<laughs> thing, you know, that I kind of refer to. You know, it's kind of like throwing like a tennis ball. And if it sticks, um, you're in for goodness. Um, I work um, as a commercials director. Um, so after university, I was like, oh, I need to make some money. Art is expensive. Um, so I started writing um, in advertising and then moved into research for filmmakers and eventually went into directing my own stuff. Um, I'm currently doing a research project on the history of sitcoms in South Africa. Um, and then done some research on boredom as an aesthetic. Um, so I just have these really strange fascinations <laughs> outside of major look, but yeah. Um, so my day job work is more in the arts. Um, I've been running non-profit organizations mostly. Um, like uh, for some time I ran the National Association of Artists in South Africa and now I run a company actually that does research work in the arts. Um, and then I, yeah, I run a range of projects as well um, around themes like restitution and uh, like collective organizing practices on the African continent, stuff like that. Commons, way, way, way. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> now you? Thank you. Well, but you've been lucky. Well, uh, first of all, uh, I'm so happy that finally someone that is not speaking in the, their practice as a persona, mm -hmm. like so nice for me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I guess some questions I have is one. First of all, I see that it's super research based uh, your work, but I was wondering if. Uh, your method always starts with research or if you ever start like an investigation from like a aesthetic or a um, methodic or mm -hmm. some other approach and then the other question is uh, how like because of course working with people is so nice but it can also be I don't know, people can feel that their work is not being paid back or like all this stuff and how do you manage to make sure that everyone is still uh, comfortable and happy to gather and yeah. Um, our, our work tends to move out of research um, but there are instances where we will work from intuition and just be like, that is a thing. We don't know what the thing is just yet. Um, for instance, there's that project in 2014 on love that maybe started in 2010. We started kind of seeing this practice in South Africa where couples will stand on a street corner at night just to kind of meet in public for like a private moment. And we just started wondering why do that? Why not go to like, MACDs for like a date or like go back to your apartment mm -hmm. and then when you start kind of looking at it it just throws up all these different um, social dynamics the research um, the research um, but in the meantime there's just kind of this nagging thing that there's there's knowledges there to kind of unearth mm -hmm. um, and the thing that took the longest was actually about a form um, so for the longest time we were thinking Mm, this is photography potentially or like film, but just doesn't feel right. There's just something kind of icky about it and voyeuristic. Um, and over the four year period, um, different forms came to us and then we eventually settled on architectural drawings of these corners to kind of determine why it is that people meet on that corner and not that corner. Um, so we do like these very pseudo scientific kind of light measurements how many people walk through that space to like enable safety, but also like, you know, some intimacy. Um, so all these different things um, that people in the back of their minds are calculating, you know, to actually determine that as a corner 11 corner. But then we quickly discovered that that one medium actually shrank the practice to something that felt very scientific and very analytical when it was so much more. It was like about tenderness, there was a historical um, jure, as Malimo mentioned, where actually in South Africa, Black Lab has very much always been 
open for public view um, and privacy has never been something that is afforded to like the black subject in South Africa. Because of the public. Um, because of like, subject. yeah, because of like, you know, um, apartheid ideology, but that still persists into uh, the contemporary. Um, so from that one medium, it was like, okay, cool, you need to go into the tenderness element. The tenderness element became another form. Then that form is like, no, 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 you need more. Uh, there's so much more to this practice. And then that's how, for instance, we have this uh, multiple media um, sort of work that speaks about one thing. So that was from uh, like intuition, and then research kind of came much later. And that research itself isn't always a kind of um, historical digging up and the academic modes of research um, of going into like the library, for instance. Um, a lot of our research is very person to person, um, going up to friends like, hey, do you know this thing? And they're like, yeah, I know this thing. Like, what are you guys doing? And from there, you kind of build something out of intuition. What was the second question? About the um, Morticia, I guess. How to take care of the people you are collaborating with? Ah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So one thing is we pay people. <laughs> labor is labor, yeah. Um, I mean, sometimes we've asked for free favors, but generally there'll be money involved. Um, because we both work, it means that we can do a lot of work kind of by our own choice instead of the things that sell. Um, so we can spend a lot of the research time and the development time kind of just on these Thursdays over dinner. Um, and then we will find money and we'll pay people. So that's definitely one thing. I think the other thing is that, um, which is why we don't necessarily say that we like, we work in a big collective. We work as two, to be honest, and then we bring people onto a project. So there's often quite a clear sense of like where, where their contribution begins and ends, and we try to be quite respectful of that. So try not to like um, drag them too far in it. So for example, with Mpati, the D plant music DJ, uh, we, he's played for us how many times? Like, Maybe at least like five, five, six times. Yeah. And every time we've paid him again, but maybe from a different project, we've fundraised from something else. Um, so it's not like we paid him the first time and then we asked for a payment or something like this. Um, that said, I mean, I think that uh, a lot of our community of practice, we're like, they're giving us a lot in between that isn't paid for. So it's not like they only work with us because we pay them. Um, there is, I mean, there is a lot of this kind of um, investment in each other's work that goes way beyond that. So, for example, um, myself and my sister run a community garden, that one we were locked out of, and um, Temba is part of that community garden, for example, and that's not paid work, that's just, yeah. I mean, there's also the mutual benefaction that we spoke about mm -hmm. um, earlier, where we also try to connect people within the community um, so that people we think are interesting and doing amazing work, um, and we think they should know of each other, we try to enable that. Um, and a classic example is farmers. Uh, farmers know of each other, but because they are farming, don't answer emails, and don't <laughs> go out. <laughs> um, they don't have much opportunity to kind of collaborate and uh, find other possibilities for their work. Um, and so we try to kind of just match make um, in that sense, mm. yeah. Um, and when friends, again, do need us for their projects, we try to jump on. Now your question, please. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks for the talk. And then, um, it's very simple, actually. We've been talking about two, two uh, countries in Africa, like South Africa and Tanzania, where you've been working. Is there any other country in Africa that you have at? a project or something, and then um, why did you come to Germany? <laughs> <laughs> um, we have worked in Uganda, it wasn't uh, Tanzania. Um, With Namibia. Uh, Namibia. We have some friends who are in Marrakesh um, who came down to South Africa for um, this documenta iteration um, in Johannesburg that we had in November. Um, and we are hoping to go to their context uh, very soon. Um, we should work from Mali 
and yeah. Cameroon. Yeah, but there's also ongoing um, collaborations and discussions within the documentary group from people who are from the continent, but also from other spaces that form part of the majority world. Um, we came to Germany on invitation um, from the DRD to be on residency for the 12 months. We have two months left. Yeah. Do we have another question? Yes, please. maybe develop an idea or um, maybe see something in the UGC within your work, maybe? Um, like within our own work? Or yeah, well maybe or like, a, um, maybe like a light bulb moment in a discussion or someone says something, maybe see something differently. We call them truth bombs. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, definitely many, many, many. Um, where, where people have helped us kind of see our own practice quite differently has been um, uh, definitely, and then like some of the subject material that we've worked on. Um, good we, example. We have um, a section on our website called Also Look At, mm -hmm. which are, you know, you'll do like a Wikipedia page, and there'll be hyperlinks and whatever, or you'll search for Ryan Reynolds also look for. Um, so the, the section on our website is exactly that. It's kind of like the, the hyper link section of the website where um, there are artists, writers who have been very influential um, to our work or like a particular project. Um, so for example, that project on love, one of the first people we looked at was um, How Do Africans Kiss by Zina Sarawiwa. Um, then a few years later, uh, Moonlight came out, and we did like a, I think a conference paper on Moonlight, for example, um, and why it is that we find it so important. Um, there's but, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I mean, are you are you asking about within our projects, like in our discussions and things well, like that? Well, I'm wondering if there's ever like a discussion, um, and someone says something that changed your mind, or suddenly, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, for you, sure. you develop maybe an idea from there, like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So I can give small examples. I can't think of like a really good example, but and they're definitely good ones. I just can't think of them. Um, for example, the project at Giardini that we worked on, which is this one with the um, archive of gardens, and then we build gardens in that project. So we um, we've done them in multiple places, and uh, we actually construct gardens, and we usually construct the gardens based on. Uh, usually black or of color gardening practices in that city. So um, we're about to build one in Cincinnati, for example, and, and we're doing a whole lot of research around um, black gardening practices in Ohio. Mm -hmm. uh, my American geography is not so good. Um, and uh, when we first started that project, there were a few truth bombs. Um, one of them was Temba, uh, kind of Naria sort of insinuated this, the, the beekeeper. Um, so the, the big thing with land and land issues in South Africa is that 80% of the population was moved onto 13% of the land in 1913. And that's pretty much stayed the same, even though Mandela was like, well, so long ago. Um, and Temba was saying that um, the reason he became, one of the main reasons he became a beekeeper was because he didn't, he was trained as a farmer, but he couldn't access land. He was a land, landless farmer. And so he had to farm in trees by putting hives in trees. Um, and that really shifted our way of thinking about um, relationship to the land, not just being about ownership. And um, Mutupi, the guy who works, he's a farm worker. He lives in like a shanty house. The guy who was with all the knowledge right in the beginning. Um, he lives in like a self-constructed little, it's not even like a house house. Um, he's quite a poor person and he works on someone else's land even though that's his ancestral land. It's a, a, a settler person who owns the land. Um, and yet he has this relationship to the land even though it's not ownership. And this is really important in South Africa because South Africa is really obsessed with ownership right now. It, it, like, we think that the only way to fix this issue is to own it. And yet there are all these people who are doing this really interesting thing of having deep relationship with the land outside of ownership. Um, another example, um, which was also, it was, I had another one. 
Oh, well, sorry. Mm. Hopefully that yeah, kind of... Okay. Beautiful. Um, looking at the times, already almost eight, and this could continue uh, the whole evening, and it gives us a good idea how your Thursday evenings <laughs> 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 look like. I get the feeling I would like to join. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Yes, I have a, a long list of questions I could ask. Um, I'm sure you do too, but um, I would like to close off with a final question. Advice. Yes. <laughs> so, um, I've been thinking about this. The final piece of advice, you know, for all um, all of us here in the room, all the becoming artists, architects, designers, etc. Um, you know, you're a few years ahead. Um, yeah, what, what's the best piece of advice you could share with them? With us? I, I was thinking about this actually in relation to the last guy. <laughs> Sorry, I missed his name. Um, who, where you were saying that he was saying, don't take advice. And I think he meant, don't take advice from the wrong people. Mm -hmm. um, and, and when you were talking about community of practice, I was thinking, find the right people to take advice from. Um, because in many, in many ways, kind of like your question, um, surrounding yourselves with people who really sort of stretch your way of thinking and come from very different perspectives, um, those are the people that you want to give you advice. Um, don't take advice from the wrong people. Um, and find good people to, to work with and to bounce ideas off with. Um, there's, I mean, I think we all know that this image of the like, lone artist in the basement <laughs> painting <laughs> uh, is not real, no. I mean, most artists are working in very social ways, actually. Um, and the more intentional we are about it, I think the more valuable those relationships can be. Mine would be and this is going to sound like such a contradiction after like speaking about intentionality the whole time, but also don't be too precious. There are projects of ours that we have disowned. <laughs> that we were like, whoa, no, nope, we were students. Or, <laughs> or there's, there's something from that failure that um, you can still learn from. Um, nothing is a complete failure. Um, so for instance, that sermon on the train work that I spoke about early on, there's so many things about it that we find problematic and we think don't work, but there are multiple elements that we can still track our practice back to. Um, there's always through lines and threads, um, even if there's dead ends, you can circumnavigate those or like rewire them to other points in your practice. So yeah, let loose. Don't be too precious. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. A warm applause <laughs> for the two of you. Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you guys for being here. It's our second to last session. Next week, next Monday, we will see each other in the second half of you guys will present your collaborative works. They all did collaborative works as well in, in mixed groups that they didn't know before. But once again, thank you for being here on a Monday. Thank you guys. It was amazing, super inspiring. It took a lot with me. Good. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.